My name is Jennifer Frick Rupert. I'm a professor of both biology and environmental science at Brevard College, which is a small teaching college in Western North Carolina. I've been teaching for 21 years and really enjoy being in the classroom. The way I got started with Blue Ghost, when I first moved to, to Brevard, so I've been in Brevard over 20 years. Um, I'm from South Carolina originally, grew up there and went to Clemson, did my PhD, and then I got the job here at Brevard College. And my husband and I bought some land out in Balsam Grove, up towards the parkway from Brevard, in um, a very isolated and beautiful spot. We would go out at night in June and see these fireflies that would glow but not flash. And being very curious about them, we collected some of the fireflies. I had a connection, as I said, to Clemson, so I took them back down to Clemson, which has a fan fantastic arthropod museum. And I was able to identify them there, so that's where I learned their Latin name. They're called Thousus reticulata. And I was able to look at the specimens that they had there and learn something more about the ones that I had. They're totally unexpected. You expect to see a firefly that flashes. So when you see a firefly that glows, it immediately catches your attention. You can't just see them in your world for most of us. You can't just see them in your yard. If you have a forested area around your house, you can. So if you've got beautiful forested area that backs up onto a little creek where you've got some nice big trees and they've been there a long time, you have the potential of having blue ghosts there. And I encourage people to get out and look for them. The effect of the blue ghost phenomenon itself is, is one that the only word I can really use is magical. And as a scientist, I don't like to use the word magical, but that is what it seems like. You're sitting in a forest. It's early June or late May. It's absolutely quiet, and it just starts to get dark around you. And as you're beginning to get a little sleepy, you're sort of shutting down because it's, you're, that light level is decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And then suddenly these tiny lights come on and they're glowing through the forest. It, it looks like elves that are carrying lights through the forest, carrying little candles through the forest, or fairies. Some people call them blue fairies. You see that phenomenon and it's just so quiet and beautiful and almost surreal that you, you, it's hard to believe that it is real. And I think that's the phenomenon that attracts people. It's something, it ties you back to nature in a non-threatening way and in a beautiful way and in a way that makes you more curious. And I think that's what really attracts people's attention. And just about that same time was when uh, DuPont State Forest was, was transitioning from, it was becoming a state forest, right? That, that's also happened just about 15 to 20 years ago. And the people who were looking at it, um, wondering if they needed to, to, to transition this land over into a state forest, they wanted to know what was there and they found these glowing fireflies. Then the question that I got was, oh my gosh, here are fireflies, there's something wrong with them and have they been affected by all the chemicals that are produced by the DuPont Chemical Corporation? So I was able to reassure them that no, this was not a genetic anomaly. These were actual fireflies that were normal. This is how they do their thing. Um, but that was the, the first question that I got. And, and so we started this whole thing 15 or 20 years ago um, in DuPont State Forest. Aline Steinberg uh, was one of the first people who came and talked with me about that. She now has the visitor center at DuPont named after her because she's been so instrumental in the development of the park and the friends of DuPont. So that was how we really first got started with that. Um, I had noticed them, was curious about them, then I got this call from DuPont. And just about at the same time, I was talking with some of my students about, um, about this phenomenon because it's, so, it's just so interesting, it's wonderful to see in, in real life. And one of the things we do here at Brevard College, our, our mission is experiential education, which means hands-on, in the field, um, learning and exploring and asking questions and then reflecting on what you learned. Um, so that means that we get our students involved in our projects. As I talked with some of my students about this, one student who was a very strong science student said he really wanted to do a science project that was on something new and unknown. And I said, I've got the animal for you, a blue ghost firefly, uh, because only one paper had been published on them in the 1960s. So the work that we did at that time 
we published the paper in 2006 was the first one that had been published in 40 years on blue ghost fireflies. There's been a lot more interest and activity in them since and, and several other firefly researchers that are um, well-known researchers across the, the southeast are working on blue ghosts now too and, and were then but uh, Josh and I were the first people who really put that all together uh, in the early 2000s. And so, the, so we had student interest, I had personal interest, and I had uh, interest from the community. And that when all those things come together, it's time to start looking into a phenomenon. The reason that blue ghosts are different from our other fireflies really comes back to their basic biology. And that is that only the male blue ghost can fly. The female blue ghosts have no wings. They, in fact, the female bodies are transparent. You can actually look through them and see the organs on the inside of their bodies. And they have the larval shape. So they still look like a large, fat, full of egg larva form. And they're crawling around on the forest floor. Now, blue ghosts are only about a half a millimeter long, which is the size of a, um, a grain of rice. And they live in leaf litter. They're predators in leaf litter. Be very glad that you aren't half a millimeter in size because you would be terrified by blue ghosts. Blue ghosts are vicious predators roaming through the leaf litter, but they're tiny. Um, in any case, the females are in that leaf litter. They're the size of a rice grain. And so if you have an area that doesn't have leaf litter, there won't be blue ghosts there. And moreover, if you denude a forest, if you cut down a forest and remove the forest floor from that area, those blue ghosts won't recolonize it because the only ones that fly are the males. So once blue ghosts are removed from an area, it's very, very hard for them to be able to recolonize an area. And that's what we've seen with my student research, the, the sizes or the distribution of the blue ghost range has decreased over time. And, and there, can ha there can have been foresting activities. You could be harvesting trees out of a forest without destroying the leaf litter layer. But if you've had um, an agricultural site, if you've had a um, building site where you've actually removed soil, that's what's going to eliminate the blue ghost. They do not repopulate very quickly at all. It's difficult for them to recolonize an area. Yeah, so another really important aspect of their biology, so that, that female being um, flightless, and not having a very strong exoskeleton, it means that she dries out really easily. So the females have to stay in an area that's moist. So the best place to find a blue ghost is in an area that is forested, that has deep leaf litter, and that is moist. And oftentimes that's on a north facing slope, it's in a cove that's got a little tiny stream in the bottom. That's perfect habitat for them. And as long as you had that bit of habitat that's been maintained, then there's the ability to keep the blue ghost in that area. And maybe even that can become a cradle from which there's a greater distribution of the blue ghost out. Um, weather will affect the viewing of blue ghost. They, they typically are most active in the end of May and the beginning of June. That's their window of most activity. And by the way, by activity, what I mean is that you're seeing the males flying around looking for females. Blue ghosts are present year round, but what we see is the period of time that they're mating. And the way that they're communicating with each other is through light. All fireflies communicate through light. Um, they're visual creatures just like we are, but they're active at night. So instead of having fancy colors to display to each other, um, the way some birds do or the way some colorful insects do, fireflies communicate using light. So that's why they're active at night and we're seeing that that action take place. There are two aspects to the time frame of trying to view blue ghosts. One is that, that about May 15th to June 15th is, is the historical time frame that we have, have really worked with and understood. Um, it does seem to be that that time frame is moving back a little bit, meaning that they're coming out a little bit earlier in the season. And people have asked me, is that related to climate change? The answer is probably because we have been able to determine that they are sensitive to the temperature of the ground. So again, if we go back to the concept of the activity levels of the blue ghost is related to the mating period, what happens is that male and female insects of, of all different types of insects metamorphose from a pupa into an adult. And that transition from that pupal phase is driven by ground temperature. So if there is an earlier or warmer 
ground temperature, if the ground temperature gets warmer earlier, then there is an earlier metamorphosis taking place and that's why we see them a little bit earlier. Another question that you asked too was about how weather affects the blue ghost. And um, weather will affect them. They cannot fly when there's a very heavy rainstorm. And in fact, they can actually be drowned by it. They can't escape it if there's a heavy flood. So these really heavy rains that we have, if they hit right at the peak activity period of the day, um, they can decrease blue ghost populations. But they're even more sensitive to drought years. Years where we've had a series, uh, a, a significant drought in April and May really decreases the number of blue ghosts that we see. This year in 2018, it's been a good year because we've had these constant rainstorms. And even though Western North Carolina has been hit by some really heavy rains, mostly here in the Brevard area, it's been low level rains over a period of time. And that, that rain has encouraged them. So the numbers this year are good because we've had the right kind of moisture conditions. The study that my um, student Josh and I did looked at the distribution of blue ghosts. They're found throughout the Southern Appalachians. We found them really concentrated here in Western North Carolina and Eastern Tennessee, Northeast Georgia, um, I guess Northwest South Carolina. That seems to be the nexus. But the collections documented them over a wider range, all the way down actually into Florida, Northern Florida. So we suspect that perhaps historically 500 years ago, the whole of the Southeast may have had blue ghost associated with this area. Um, but now we're seeing them being restricted into smaller areas, mainly because of development. As, as development has encroached on their habitat and they haven't been able to recolonize from that period that we've seen now a more restricted area. So Southern Appalachians definitely is the the center of distribution and I always encourage people to, to appreciate where you live. You can go nowhere else in the world and see blue ghost fireflies. You can sit in Transylvania County and see something that nobody else around the world can see. All you have to do is go outside at night. And the best time to go outside at night is right after it gets dark. This time of year we're approaching the longest day of the year, the shortest night. It doesn't get night around here until starting about 9 p.m. But if you get out there right as it's starting to get dark from 9.30 to 10 is really the peak of their activity, they'll go until about midnight, but after midnight it begins to peter out. You don't see nearly as much activity, which is really useful if you're a scientist trying to stay up and observe all this and then have to get up the next morning and do some work. I think, I think that the reason that we see them in the Southern Appalachians in particular is because what the mountains do is create microhabitats you can get on one slope of the mountain, the north side of the mountain. For instance, north facing, facing slopes are known for being wetter and damper and richer in wildflowers. They're also richer in blue ghost. The southern side of the mountain is going to get a lot more sunlight and drying and exposure, and that's not as good for them. Elevation probably does affect them too. Um, they've been collected though from Mount Pisgah which is up pretty high at elevation. I'm not sure of the total height there, but around 6,000 feet. And down into Brevard, which is at 2,000 feet. So the elevation, I don't think it, it, I don't think that there are more blue ghosts at a lower or higher elevation. I just think that they probably are active at different periods based on, again, when the, when the ground warms up. And it, the ground is gonna be warmer, lower, earlier. Trying to preserve habitat for blue ghost fireflies, I think it is a challenge. One of the things that we want to be sure we do is maintain forested areas, so state parks, um, national forest areas where you can still use the forest, but to be aware of those types of forest use. Again, as I've said before, you can log an area and remove trees from it without actually damaging the blue ghost if you do it without damaging the leaf litter layer. So you, there needs to be some thought about how that's being done. One of the things, though, that, that we really have to be careful of is that as blue ghost popularity has increased and more and more people want to see them, they're concentrating their, their attention, people's attention is being concentrated into a few areas, and that's actually damaging the population in those areas. The blue ghosts are known from DuPont State Forest, but that's not the only place they occur. 
And in fact, what's happened is that they're being loved to death in, Blue, in uh, DuPont State Forest because so many people are concentrating into one area and they're, they're trampling through the forest, they've got their dogs, they've got strollers, they've got a lot of people, and those females are on the ground they come out for a short period to mate with a male, and it would be so easy for someone to step on them without knowing that they were, and then damaging that population. So DuPont is restricting the number of um, visitors that can come in during blue ghost season so that they're trying to protect that habitat and protect that population. Uh, they're, just, they're just too many people concentrated in too small of an area. So what I encourage people to do, um, I want people to get out and enjoy the natural world and I want them to see blue ghosts because they're just such a fabulous phenomenon. But really the way to see them, the way to have an experience of blue ghost is to go out into the forest and stay there overnight. Go camping somewhere. Find yourself a spot and sit for hours in quiet without a lot of other people around and enjoy what you're seeing in nature. So people often, often ask me, if I'm walking around in the forest, how am I going to be able to see where I'm going um, without disturbing the blue ghost? And there's really a simple answer to that. You can use a flashlight, but you need to make it red so that you are not, it's actually not disturbing your own eyes. Your eyes are adjusting to that. In, instead of having the bright white light, you have a red light. The easiest way to do that is to take your, um, to take your flashlight and buy yourself a piece of red cellophane um, plastic. Buy yourself a piece of red cellophane plastic. You can buy, um, I've seen Christmas bags that are made out of red plastic. Put that over the top of your flashlight and put it on there with a rubber band and you've got an automatic red light. And you can now use that in the forest. So that way you can get around. Again, you know, cut it off when you don't need it. You don't want it on shining all the time. But that'll get you down to the trail without tripping over your feet and get you out into the forest. Okay, so I, I've written a, a few books and I also have one to recommend if you're interested in learning more about fireflies. Uh, Lynn Faust, who's over in Tennessee, has just published this really nice book, Fireflies, Glowworms, and Lightning Bugs. They, uh, she has some great photographs in there and tells you about all the different species of fireflies. We have many, many species of fireflies, not just blue ghost and synchronous fireflies. All those are the beautiful ones. And my books, um, I have written one called Mountain Nature, A Seasonal Natural History of the Southern Appalachians. I set it up to be a seasonal description of what you're going to see when you go outdoors in nature. Instead of having to haul along a book on wildflowers and a book on trees and a book on insects and a book on birds, I wanted to be able to take one book into the field with my students that had a description of what we were going to see. So it's got lots of photographs. It does have pictures of blue ghost in here too. If you want to learn more about the Southern Appalachians, I encourage you to get out there and find this one. I've written two other books too. Uh, this book's called Waterways, uh, Sailing the Southeastern Coast. I'm a sailor too. There's a picture of me on the back while I'm fishing offshore. And uh, my, husband and I, I, my husband and I like to sail, but when we sail, we're also thinking about the natural world that we're sailing through. And one of the things that we liked so much about sailing is that it puts you in such direct contact with the world around you that it's, it's like going out to see the blue ghost, except for your sailing and looking at jellyfish. Enjoyed that aspect. And then the last book, the one I wrote just this last year, is called The Legend of Skyco Spirit Quest. It's a historical book about what it would have been like to live in North Carolina before Europeans arrived. And I've really based it on our biological knowledge, our historical knowledge, and archeological information that we've gathered from the native people who lived here at that time. And, and I imagined what it would be like to be a boy growing up in the Southeast during that period of time. So those are three books that I would encourage you to look at. Um, all the books are available online and also at your local bookstore. So I encourage you to shop locally. <laughs>